Death Valley. Here on the desert floor, the temperature can soar to more than 130 degrees on a summer afternoon, making it unfit for human life. It may seem ironic that here in the middle of this harsh, arid landscape, there was so much water flowing in the Colorado River, at times with such ferocity, that it had to be controlled. The Colorado River is one of the most picturesque in the world, but its beauty hides a moody, unpredictable, destructive side. This is the river that cut open the earth to sculpt the greatest geologic feature on the planet, the Grand Canyon. Drop by drop, eon by eon, it is the supreme architect of canyons. For millions of years, it has sliced through the American West, draining an area of 242,000 square miles in what are now seven states. In spring and early summer, gorging itself on the melting snowpack in the Rocky Mountains, the Colorado periodically rose up and overflowed its banks, wiping out farms and flooding towns on its rampaging course down to the Gulf of California in Mexico. Small earthen dams had been erected in futile attempts to control it, but by 1920, it became clear that something monumental had to be done. The job fell to the Federal Bureau of Reclamation to put a concrete cork in this mighty bottle, a dam like no other on Earth. In 1920 and 21, there were boats along the Colorado River here, making runs up and down the river, taking soundings and drillings, trying to find an appropriate place where we write geologically. And uh, in 21, uh, they looked at, particularly up at uh, Boulder Canyon. And for a long time, they thought they were going to build the dam up in Boulder Canyon. In addition to the dam itself, the Boulder Dam project would include canals and waterways to irrigate most of Southern California and parts of Nevada and Arizona. The dam was designed to serve three purposes. It would control the flooding river, it would use the water in its reservoir to irrigate the desert, and the hydroelectric power it generated would supply electricity to hundreds of western cities. Later, government engineers decided it would be better to corral the Colorado not at Boulder Canyon, but at a place called Black Canyon, about 10 miles south of the original site. The original Boulder Canyon would not have impounded as much water, and there were questions about the geology associated with the Boulder Canyon. So when they started looking, they still called it the Boulder Canyon Project but the location is the Black Canyon, and the rock turned out to be very tight in the Black Canyon. It was also a little narrower, and it turned out that it would impound even more water. Even without its rattlesnakes, Gila monsters, and tarantulas, Black Canyon would be a terrible place to be. Down inside the canyon, it was an oven in the summer, while in the winter, icy gale force winds howled incessantly. It was no place to gather a workforce, but it was in the middle of the Great Depression. And once word got out that there were going to be jobs available, some 30 miles from Las Vegas, the nation's desperate families flooded the area. The word went out across the country to the unemployed that there were jobs out here. And of course, uh, Boulder Dam had been, you know, the proposal had been all in the news in 1930 and 31. And in 1931, Las Vegas was just inundated with people from all over the country. You know, families arriving on railroad cars and box cars and hitchhiking and everything else with the idea that there were jobs. When I came here, there was 30% of the workforce in this country, in the United States, was out of a job. And you hear people groaning about, say, 5 or 6% being out of a job now. This, and then there was 30% of us out of a job and uh, there was no relief in sight. I can't really describe the horror that exists among people during depression when there were no jobs and no money and no opportunities for people who had been to college, had training, uh, or were ready for jobs. They flocked to the desert between Las Vegas and the Colorado River, camping out in clusters of makeshift shacks 
with makeshift names like Ragtown. They lived in cardboard houses. They had no running water. They had no sewage facilities. There was no school for the children. There was nothing like, uh, you know, power to run any kind of appliances. And they simply lived really out in the desert or, you know, down, down the canyon. Yeah, it was a, a desolation. It, it was terrible. You know, the people uh, just get anything they could, uh, cardboard boxes or maybe lucky enough to have a tent and uh, just anything. And then the sun and the, you know, not a spot of shade. It will never be known how many women and children died in these camps as their men waited for jobs. No figures were kept on those who succumbed to the heat, the bad water, the poor sanitation, the lack of food. I don't know how many died, but I know people did die of, uh, did die of heat stroke. And of course, they're out there in the desert, and you know, there are rattlesnakes and a whole variety of critters, you know, and people and kids who get bitten by rattlesnakes. And the best they could do for sanitation was simply take a shovel and, you know, walk out and dig a hole out there. The best they could do for, you know, keeping cool and like that was to spend their time, you know, in the river. But they kept coming. Months before the government had even awarded the contract, thousands of desperate people were trying to hold on, waiting for those jobs to come. Then, in March of 1931, a consortium of six companies was awarded the contract to build what was then called Boulder Dam. The low bid was just under $50 million, the biggest contract ever let by the government. You had such a huge undertaking when this was proposed, there was no single co construction company in the world which could have tackled this job, and so that's why the six companies got together. To make it all happen, the six companies sent an engineering genius by the name of Frank T. Crow as their superintendent of construction. Over the next five years, he would drive the men fight the weather, and tame the river to get the dam finished. Within weeks of signing the contract to build the dam, they had Crow in place. The only other things in place were a bunch of jobless men and a deadly desert. There were already plans drawn up to build a real town for the workers and their families to be called Boulder City. It would replace all the rag towns in the area and have real streets, sanitation, and a government. But the administration of President Herbert Hoover, being blamed for the Depression, did not wait for the town to be built before getting the men to work. Because of the massive unemployment, and because Hoover wanted to, President Hoover wanted to uh, put people to work as soon as possible and as many as possible, so this could be an issue in the 1932 election. So he can say, look, you know, Herbert Hoover does care, I should be reelected. And, uh, you know, we are putting people to work and things like this. So this was uh, six or seven months before the men should have been there. To make sure everyone got the message, the administration changed the name of the project to Hoover Dam. So now the Boulder Canyon Dam was not in Boulder Canyon anymore. It was in Black Canyon. And it was not even Boulder Dam anymore. It was Hoover Dam. Whatever it was going to be called and wherever it was going to be, with the hot summer of 1931 approaching, Frank Crow and six companies were about to get the greatest government construction project in American history underway. A road from Las Vegas to the Boulder City site had already been graded, and the Union Pacific had laid tracks from Las Vegas by the time six companies incorporated landed the contract for the dam. Boulder City was unique. It shot up out of the desert almost overnight. Not since the American Gold Rush days had a town sprung to life so quickly. But this was no wide open boom town. This town was built and run by the government, fenced off from the rest of the world to keep out the jobless, the homeless, and the unregulated businesses. One of the things that they didn't want Boulder City to become, and that's the reason they set up the reservation, they didn't want it to be like just another construction camp or like a mining camp, you know, which would be full of saloons, full of single men drinking, full of brothels, full of gambling, crime, and like that. The police force was comprised of U.S. Marshals, and they enforced the government and six companies' rules unerringly, even to the point of strike-breaking. 
as arbitrary and dictatorial as the town government may have been, Boulder City became a model town. Within weeks, where there was once only cactus and Joshua trees, there were homes, an administration building, a hospital, barracks, a mess hall for the single workers, a recreation hall, a company store, trees and lawns were planted. But this oasis was only for the lucky few who could get jobs. They set up a gate on the highway, and in order for you to get in there, you had to be registered with six companies and have a pass card, you know, uh, written, signed by Frank Crow, the general superintendent. Otherwise, you couldn't get in there. By late spring of 1931, before Boulder City was ready for residents, Frank Crow and the six companies were hiring men to begin work on the dam. But there was not enough work to go around. Desperate men clamored for the 5,500 jobs that would eventually become available. Some people would go in there and sign up on four or five different names. And, uh, you know, if they needed a laborer or a carpenter or whatever, why, if this guy's name came up in proper sequence, why, one guy got a job under one of his assumed names and he stayed with it all the way through the dam, which I thought was kind of kind of fun, funny. <laughs> My dad's name was Irving Bradshaw Earl, so he applied under Irving B. Earl, Irving Bradshaw Earl, Earl Bradshaw, Earl Irving, and everything else. And finally, he had an uncle who knew somebody who knew somebody, and he was able to get a job in the dam. Before these thousands of newly hired construction workers could make the dam rise out of Black Canyon, they had to find a way to get themselves and their equipment into Black Canyon. Coming up, the explosive heart of Black Canyon, where workers risked their lives and even gave their lives for a mere $4 a day, next on Discovery Sunday. This program is brought to you in part by the Jamaica Tourist Board. Come to Jamaica and feel all right. I am jungle. I am sun dancing on water. I am solid rock. I am liquid sky. A voice that whispers to your heart, come to me. I am Jamaica. Call your travel agent or 1-800-JAMAICA. Disgusting. Completely tasteless. The champagne's not Corbel. Corbel, for people who know champagne. It wasn't much of a gift shop. It wasn't much of a fire. It was pretty much everything to Joe and Linda. It was gone pretty fast. A small, bright dot in the night sky, then nothing. And by now, someone may be watching this and saying, not unkindly, but still saying it, who cares? So we just wanted to say, well, there's Joe, there's Linda, and there's us. Cigna, a business of caring. My husband and I made a bet. I said 10321 was cheaper, he thought AT&T was. Well, the phone bill is here and he lost. Turns out 10321 saved 50% off every call over 20 minutes. We saved $18 on a $50 phone bill. 10321. Some decisions are harder than others. The Chrysler Sebring LXI Coupe or the Sebring Limited Convertible. For the passionate side, fully independent suspension, speed-sensitive steering, multi-valve V6, and a luxurious leather-trimmed interior. The practical side, select customers get $1,500 cash back on the Sebring Coupe and $500 cash back on low lease rates on the Sebring Convertible. Some decisions are easier than others. Now, select customers save a total of five to $1,500 on Chrysler Sebring Coupe and Sebring Convertible. You're watching the Discovery Channel. Explore your world. From the Discovery Channel and ABC News, Discovery News Break. Good evening. The FDA has approved a new super aspirin for heart attack victims. The drug, Agristat, was inspired by an African snake. It works by thinning the blood the way the snake's venom does. And the Los Angeles Zoo has acquired two rare Anoas. These dwarf buffalo from Indonesia stand only three feet tall. There are less than 300 of them left in the world. That's Discovery Newsbreak. This Discovery Newsbreak has been brought to you by Walmart. Always low prices, always Walmart.
A lot of us have babies of our own. So when a little girl in our community needed special help, our store raised money for the Children's Miracle Network who helped make it possible for Taylor to walk. And she decided to thank us by doing her therapy in our store where her grandfather brought her every day. Every year we raise money all over the country for kids like Taylor so we can watch these little miracles grow up all around us because we live here too and we believe good works. Their history is buried deep within the sands of time. But now, newly discovered temples, tombs, and writings are redefining all we've ever known about ancient Egypt. Call now to get Egypt Uncovered, a five-volume video exclusive from Discovery Channel for just three payments of $24.95. Shot on locations off-limits to the public, you'll see how the tombs of fallen pharaohs were looted by priests to finance the burials of future kings. You'll meet the world's oldest mummies and find out how they're being used to cure modern strains of ancient diseases. And you'll encounter the remains of the world's oldest dam, a massive engineering project that took 500 men 10 years to build. In Egypt Uncovered, a civilization long gone has never seemed more alive. Call now and receive the entire five-volume set for three payments of $24.95 plus shipping and handling. Or send a check or money order to the address on your screen. Your satisfaction is guaranteed, so order now. We now return to Building of Hoover Dam. Explore. The first part of building Hoover Dam had nothing to do with building it. It had to do with just trying to get to Black Canyon. There were few places on Earth more inaccessible. Its sheer rock walls jutted straight up 1,000 feet from the river. And there was nothing but solid mountain between the canyon's rim and the nearest road. The first equipment and men on the job had to be floated in to begin clearing space to work. But it was impossible to get the thousands of tons of equipment and material to the river that way. The only way to get the men and equipment to the job was to blast their way through the mountains, then etch switchbacks down to the river. First thing you do is do what we call infrastructure construction, and that is that you don't just go in and start digging. You have to put the roads in. So the first thing is build the roads. As road building goes, this was as tough as it gets. This is the original access road, hewn from virtually solid rock for two miles, running from the canyon's rim down to the dam site. Once at the river, more roads had to be built, like shelves in the canyon wall, for men and machinery to move sometimes by tunnels blasted through the canyon walls themselves. At times, it looked like they were blasting apart the whole canyon as they blew away thousands of tons of rock to make way for access roads and tunnels. Some 21 miles of railroad also had to be put down to eventually deliver all the material needed for construction. When the operations were at their height in little more than a year, these tracks would carry a volume of traffic heavier than any main railroad line in the nation. You had a special track that went down to the place where the visitor center is today, right down the, the middle of that road. There used to be rails, and they were very steep, and they had a locomotive called a shea which was, yeah, it was a geared locomotive. It was the only type of a locomotive in the days of steam that could handle that sort of thing. To ensure that material got to where it was going to be needed, two miles of this railroad had to be built inside the solid rock of the canyon wall. The workers made Swiss cheese out of the canyon, boring more than 60 tunnels, which totaled more than seven miles through rock so solid, no timbering was required to shore up the walls. No materials or workers were useful without power. It is ironic that Black Canyon, which would someday power up most of Southern California, at first had to get electricity strung in from as far away as San Bernardino, California, 220 miles away. One of the first things built into the canyon walls were bunkhouses for single men to live until the barracks were ready in Boulder City. It was stifling down in the canyon, and these bunkhouses were little more than ovens, even at night. During the day, the heat was unbearable. 
At the height of the summer of 1931, the first summer working down in the canyon, the average daily high was 119 degrees. The average low was 95. It was dirty, dangerous, hot work. And the reason why people like Cliff Jones could eventually get a job is some of those jobs, people would go down there and they would take one look at that dam and they'd say, no, I don't want to, I don't want to live and die here. And men were certainly dying from the heat and from unsafe working conditions. People were more callous about life and death than they are today. Today, you're going to sue somebody. But in that era, everybody wanted a job, and somebody said, well, you know, you're going to die down there at 120 degrees. I'll take my chances. For the next five years, with few exceptions, the men would work seven days a week, day in, day out, under the most arduous and dangerous conditions in one of the most hostile places on Earth. And most of them were happy to do it. You get used to it. You're so glad you had the job. The salary wasn't, you know, I was making it when I started there $4 a day. And they took a dollar and a quarter a day out for room and board. $4 a day, $4 a day was like $4,000 a day is seemingly in, in the area today. When you could get a can of salmon for a nickel, when you could get a loaf of bread for a nickel, when you could go to a moving picture for 10 cents, four dollars is still a lot better than nothing. By 1932, with the roads and rails running down into the canyon, with electric power strung in, it seemed that six companies should be ready to start building the dam. But before they could start pouring concrete, something had to be done with that river. It took them two and a half years to divert the Colorado River. The first thing they had to do when they came to this project, what are you going to do with the Colorado River while you're building the dam and power plant? They had to divert it. The only way to divert the river was not around the rock of the canyon walls, but right through the rock. Engineers would have to dig tunnels big enough to carry the mighty Colorado at its most ferocious flood stage. These people had to go in with pneumatic drills, drill a pattern of holes, blast it with dynamite, muck it out, which means dig it up and load it and haul it away, and get rid of the broken rock. To handle all the water the Colorado River was capable of throwing at them, some one and a half million gallons per second at flood stage, engineers had to dig out four separate diversion tunnels, two on the Nevada side of the canyon and two in Arizona. The diversion tunnels had been one of the first jobs started, and they attacked them from four different directions to speed things up. They started drilling from the upstream side, where the river would enter, and from the downstream side, where the water would return to its normal course. But to get the job done quicker, they drilled access tunnels called adits, crossways from the river, to where the diversion tunnel would run through the mountain. Then they started digging from the inside out, in both directions. This meant that all four diversion tunnels were being dug in four different directions, all at the same time. No rock tunnels this massive had ever been attempted before, each one some 56 feet in diameter and running approximately 4,000 feet, ending up with more than three miles of these giant tunnels cut through the canyon rock. They dwarfed the men and machines that dug them, and since there was no equipment made to handle a job this size, six companies had to jury rig their own. Drilling rigs called jumbos were built on top of old World War I truck beds. They held up to 30 men simultaneously attacking the rock with 144 pound drills powered by compressed air. It was a noisy, dirty, dangerous job. But one of the biggest threats to life was what happened next trucks. More than 100 trucks at a time were at work hauling the blasted rock called muck out of the four diversion tunnels. You'd get on the line just as quick as you could. That meant uh, probably pull in with 35 or 40 trucks and they'd, they'd start loading them out uh, with a shovel. It'd only take about two shovels to load a truck. Of course I was young, maybe I was stupid, I don't know, but uh, 
Uh, each one of us kind of fell in love with our particular truck. As decrepit as they were, they were uh, the means of us uh, making our five bucks a day. And uh, they could mean steady employment if you kept them running. You know, we really had a kind of an affectionate feeling for our trucks. All of us did. The most dangerous part of all was what they left behind. Silent, invisible, deadly carbon monoxide gas that hovered in the tunnels. The carbon monoxide gas was so thick in those diversion tunnels that I fear had OSHA existed in that particular era, it's quite likely that they would close that dam down in 10 minutes. It was deplorable. It will never be known how many men died of carbon monoxide poisoning. It was charged that company doctors covered up the deaths by saying most of them were due to pneumonia. If doctors had ruled the deaths were job-related, the company would have had to pay compensation. So what they were doing, I think, was obviously sacrificing men's lives or sacrificing their health, at the very least, you know, in the interest of, you know, getting on with the project. Somebody fell and was killed where the trucks were moving the muck out of the excavation for the dam. The trucks are just going like you're on an anthill, boom, 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 you know. And one truck driver stopped his truck and ran over to see what's going on. And his boss is standing there, get the hell back over there because that guy's dead, you can't help him get these trucks moving. You know, men were expendable. You know, men were expendable. By the fall of 1932, the men in Black Canyon were almost a year away from pouring the first concrete for the dam. No one could know how many more would die before that day would come. Next, with the Colorado River diverted, construction on the dam begins. Cable cars go up, concrete comes down, when Discovery Sunday returns. When your allergies are a nightmare, you need fast relief. You need the power of Zyrtec. Prescription Zyrtec starts working fast and lasts 24 hours. So when allergies are a nightmare, remember the power of Zyrtec. In studies, drowsiness was the most common side effect. Other side effects included fatigue and dry mouth. Most were mild or moderate. To learn more, ask your doctor or pharmacist. Putting your stars together with our five-star rating be a bright thing to do? Remember, kids in the back seat. And buckle up! Getting on top of your financial situation is tougher than ever. <gasps> what you need is a MetLife rep to help you get a grip on things and help you make sense of it all. Get Met. It pays. Only one retriever can hunt for houses. The new personal retriever from Coldwell Banker Online searches daily for homes matching your profile and brings them to your email. Tell it what you want, it'll go fetch. Coldwell Banker, making real estate real easy. Ah, the good old days of supermarket shopping. When nothing stood between you and your next meal. Nothing. But today, there are materials that help lock out harmful contaminants and reduce spoilage, keeping us safe and the food we eat fresh. Plastics make it possible. So now, the rest is history. At the gateway to the East, it is the keeper of knowledge and secrets. It has mystified us for centuries. But how was it built? What does it mean? The mystery of the Sphinx is next, as Discovery Sunday continues. Tomorrow on Wild Discovery, would you do this? How about this? Steve Irwin goes in search of the 10 deadliest snakes in the world on Wild Discovery. Tomorrow at 9 Mountain 8 Pacific on the Discovery Channel. Now back to building of Hoover Dam. Explore. 
Some of the most dangerous jobs at Hoover Dam were in the preliminary work on the canyon, not in building the dam itself. These men were called high scalers, and they performed a sort of boulder ballet, scooting along the side of the canyon with nothing but six or 700 feet of air between them and death. They had to risk their lives and, and take the chances of life or death by scaling those cliffs six or 700 feet in the air or 400 feet in the air, but it doesn't make any difference. If you fell 400 feet, it was the same result as if you'd fallen 700 feet. It didn't make any difference. They made the top rate in Black Canyon, $5.60 a day. Using jackhammers, pry bars, and dynamite, they had to clean the canyon face down to smooth, hard, solid rock. It was some kind of a dangerous job, dangling on a rope up there 600 feet in the air and drilling those holes with a, what we called a jackhammer and filling them with powder and then extending the detonator out to where they were later on detonated and the canyon would bring down. Hundreds of feet below the high scalers, the diversion tunnels had been lined with concrete and were nearing completion as dump trucks made thousands of trips, piling tons of rock and debris into the middle of the Colorado River. This was the first part of what was called a coffer dam, used to keep the construction site dry. Its first job, though, was to block the river and coax it out of its normal path and through the diversion tunnels. Just before noon on November 13, 1932, workers detonated a load of dynamite, destroying the levee at the entrance to tunnel number four on the Arizona side of the canyon. Gosh, Dan, just seeing that water shoot up in the air as they opened that big gate on that tunnel over there, seeing that water gush through there, that was a, an event that almost left me in awe because Having seen that river run through there, and now it's being diverted. Oh, gosh, it was really something. And for the first time in its millions of years of existence, the Colorado River found itself hijacked. Gravity now forced the river out of its ancient bed and down through the canyon walls. For the next two years, the Colorado River would be diverted this way leaving almost a mile of its riverbed to dry out. At about the time the river was being diverted, it became apparent that Hoover Dam was not only going to be the biggest dam in the world, it was going to be the most politicized dam ever. Franklin D. Roosevelt had just defeated Herbert Hoover for the presidency, and one of the first acts of the new administration was to rename the dam in Black Canyon. It would no longer be called Hoover Dam after the defeated president, but would revert back to its original name, Boulder Dam. Roosevelt could not know that two years after his death, Congress would reverse his 1933 decision and pass a law renaming it Hoover Dam, which it officially is to this day. They jockeyed around with the name under the various administrations, and the official name is, of course, Hoover Dam. However, I think most people prefer to call it Boulder Dam. In fact, uh, I've even had the question asked to me, well, where's Hoover Dam? If Boulder Dam's down here, where's Hoover Dam? It made little difference to the 5,500 men working in Black Canyon what they called it. It was home seven days a week. Now that the river had been diverted, the sediment that had built up on the canyon floor for millions of years had to be cleaned out and hauled away. The dam had to be seated on firm bedrock, which they finally hit some 40 feet below water level. The river over the centuries had scoured a channel in the middle of the bedrock down to a depth of another 75 feet. This is where the dam would be anchored. They picked up all of the loose dirt and uh, removed it. It was just dirt. And some of it was fairly firmly cemented. That's just loose material. If you poured concrete on that, it wouldn't have any footing. You'd feel kind of uh, antsy about the whole thing if you knew it was sitting on a lot of ball bearings. While they cleaned up the ancient riverbed, two coffer dams were completed. 
The coffer dams were earth-filled dams above and below the work site where the present concrete dam is located. And this made sure that the water was diverted into these four big openings in the canyon walls. The reason you have one down below is because you don't want the water backing up into the area, just as you don't want it coming down into the area. Then the day everybody had waited two years for finally arrived. On June 6, 1933, a so-called bucket of concrete, some 16 tons of the stuff, was dumped on the ancient bedrock in Black Canyon, and Hoover Dam had begun its ascent. Getting the concrete to the dam site was an engineering feat rivaling any in the world. Located in such a desolate spot, there was no way to simply have concrete delivered there. It had to be made at the site. Six companies had to build the two biggest concrete mixing plants in the world right at the dam. It is one of those ironies of nature that the Colorado River delivered to the engineers most of the ingredients necessary for its own captivity in concrete. The most important was what engineers called the aggregate, the rock, sand, and gravel that would make up three-fourths of the dam's mass. They found all the aggregate they would ever need six miles up the river from the dam site, the granddaddy of all gravel pits, courteously piled there for millions of years by the Colorado River. Fortunately for building the dam, the native rock in this area is a type that makes very, very good aggregate. And there was a lot of it sorted out by the river itself down along the stream banks. A special rail line had to be built to bring the aggregate to the on-site plants, where it would be mixed with the other two ingredients of concrete, Portland cement and water. The millions of gallons of water needed to make the concrete was also supplied by the river. The only ingredient needed to be imported was the cement. The mixing plants themselves were cutting-edge technology of the day. The two plants spit out more than 3,500 cubic yards of concrete a day. That's enough to build a 20-foot wide highway for a mile. The operation went around the clock seven days a week, eventually making up to four and a half million cubic yards of concrete. That's enough concrete to extend that one-mile highway from San Francisco to New York. For maximum strength, the engineers came up with an extremely dry mix, which meant it had to be rushed to the dam site and poured before it started setting. In the case of a very dry mix like that, you don't want a lot of time from the time that you mix it to the time that you put it into the bucket and get it to the site. Because as dry as it is, it's not going to move readily. It will actually start setting a little bit almost immediately. Superintendent Frank Crow had come up with an ingenious way to get it done. Railroad tracks and trucks could not get out to every point where concrete had to be poured, so Crow attacked the problem by air. He devised a system of cableways that picked up the giant buckets of concrete from railroad cars and delivered them with pinpoint accuracy. This cableway system also delivered men to their jobs and equipment to the proper sites throughout the construction of the dam. At the height of construction, there were nine separate cableways in operation, making the air above the canyon look like a giant desert spider had weaved a web. The cable system itself was fairly unique in having so many cables and so many controls and so on and so on. It was designed just for that, and since then there have been other similar things for other major operations all over the world, but I don't think that any has ever surpassed it. The largest cableway, able to carry 150 tons, is still in use today, delivering heavy replacement parts to the power plants 800 feet below the canyon's rim. Although the dam today looks like a big block of solid concrete, it was not built that way. The concrete was poured in five-foot layers in a series of separate columns varying in size from 60 to 25 square feet and the dam rose out of the canyon like a checkerboard in thousands of individual halting steps. The dam is an interlocking set of hundreds and thousands of individual pores. A pore was about five feet deep, 
or thick and extended maybe 45 feet by 50 feet, uh, depending upon its location within the dam structure itself. And in each pore, there was not only five feet of concrete, but there were interlocking keys, we call them, where they would extend the pore up uh, maybe six inches, and that would key into the next concrete pore. They could not pour the concrete deeper than five feet at a time because of the intense heat built up as concrete cures. Concrete is a, an interesting mixture of chemicals. There's almost every com chemical uh, combination is what is called exothermic, which means exiting heat, exo and, and thermo. And so exothermic reactions make heat. The heat's got to be removed. In fact, engineers for the Bureau of Reclamation had calculated that if the dam was built with one continuous pour, there would be so much heat to dissipate, it would take 125 years for it to cool off, meaning it would still be hot in the year 2060. But they had also calculated that this heat would put such stress on the concrete that the structure would fracture long before that time. Even with the shallow pours of only five feet, the five and a half million tons of concrete going into the dam would still build up too much heat to be dissipated naturally. For that unique problem, engineers came up with a unique solution. They would have to refrigerate Hoover Dam. When we return, an amazing refrigeration system large enough to cool the five and a half million tons of concrete poured for Hoover Dam next on Discovery Sunday. volunteer to connect schools and develop a resource that helps them discover their world. I'm starting to love volcanoes. What may be news is who created this education gateway. It wasn't AT&T or MCI. It was Bell South. Back to work, Romeo. From big business to education, we put you at the head of the class. Good afternoon, Heaven. Yeah, I'm being investigated for tax fraud. Oh, I'll put you right through, Senator. Heaven. I need brochures printed by Monday. I'm sorry, we can't help you there. Need a printing miracle? Call Alpha Graphics. I was born under a wandering star. Wheels are made for rolling, mules are made to pack. Now, for a limited time, get a 98 Trooper for $2.99 per month for 48 months with 1943 due at least signing or receive 1,000 cash back with purchase during the Isuzu Go Farther Getaway event. Offer ends May 31st. At the gateway to the East, it is the keeper of knowledge and secrets. It has mystified us for centuries, but how was it built? What does it mean? The mystery of the Sphinx is next as Discovery Sunday continues. Tomorrow on Wild Discovery, would you do this? How about this? Steve Irwin goes in search of the 10 deadliest snakes in the world on Wild Discovery. Tomorrow at 9 Mountain 8 Pacific on the Discovery Channel. For ages, man has roamed the earth in search of answers to the ultimate questions of life. Like, where did he come from? And where is he going? But if you know where to look, the answers will all fall into place. Read Scientology, The Fundamentals of Thought by L. Ron Hubbard. Your search is over, but the adventure's just begun. Get your copy today wherever paperbacks are sold. Were you awarded a legal settlement paid over time for personal injury or medical malpractice? 
Are you receiving annuity payments or lottery winnings paid over time? Are these payments too small to meet your current needs, such as buying a new home or business, paying your medical bills, or funding your child's education? If you answered yes, then you need to call Singer Asset right now. Call 800-528-1166 now for your free information kit. Learn how Singer Asset can turn your small payments due in future years to a large cash lump sum payment now. We now return to Building of Hoover Dam. Explore. The largest refrigeration unit ever built in the field was constructed down in Black Canyon. It loomed over the work site several stories high and was run seven days a week to cool off the freshly poured concrete in Hoover Dam. What they did was they had water pumps circulating the cooled water through the dam. If the river water was cool enough to use, they used it, otherwise they artificially cooled it. Before they poured the concrete into each form, they installed two-inch cooling pipes to carry the cool water in and the heated water back out. Those cooling pipes had to be protected, you might say, with your life, practically, because those had to remain there when they pumped the ice water through those cooling pipes to cool that dam off. Clifford Jones worked for a time as a puddler, the men inside the forms who had to make sure there was not a single air bubble left anywhere. What we would do is, is we would walk around on that, as that bucket was dumped, then we would start working it into that five-foot layer. It was just exhausting. You know, about the time you'd get one, uh, one bucket tromped in, here they come in with another one. They just poured those farms so terribly fast. They broke all records in pouring concrete on that dam. It had to be a solid layer there, five-foot solid layer. So we were walking on a higher level all the time. As, if, as we dumped the cement, we'd walked on a higher level. One of the enduring myths of the dam is that there were hundreds of workers buried alive in the concrete. In reality, nobody was ever entombed there. They would have gone probing for the body because they would have weakened the concrete. I mean, if you want to look at the callous disregard for life and say, oh, oh, oh poor old Joe got buried, no way. It would have weakened the concrete. And so you wouldn't have allowed it to happen. Poor old Joe, he used to beat his wife and was mean to his kids, so we don't miss him, but uh, God, get him out of the concrete. Tourists looking at the big block of concrete that is the dam today find it hard to envision that it rose out of Black Canyon in separate columns. As these columns of concrete reached for the sky, five feet at a time, they were glued together with a simple grout made of cement, sand, and water. Engineers used the canyon walls and the river itself to help strengthen the dam. By arching the shape of the dam, the pressure of the water would force the edges into the canyon sides, making it stronger than it would be if built as a straight wall slung across the canyon. This arch gravity dam, as it was called, meant that with every drop of water the river forced against the dam, it would be strengthening its own prison walls. By the beginning of 1935, Hoover Dam was nearing its final height of 726 feet equal to a 72-story building. Its base was as thick as a 66-story building lying on its side. Although it looked like a simple hunk of concrete, it was actually becoming a complex machine. And at this point, it could be seen how it was all going to work. The four water intake towers, each one shooting up almost 400 feet from the canyon sides, would gulp in the river water and feed it down giant pipes called penstocks to the U-shaped powerhouse stretching down both sides of the river behind the dam. Here, the water was fed into smaller penstock pipes that actually turned the generators on each side of the powerhouse. To the engineers and to each drop of water, it was all so simple. Okay, you are a drop of water floating in Lake Mead. Here is an intake tower and it is beckoning you, it is slurping you in. So you go in there because the general flow around the towers is into the towers. You go into this tower and drop down vertically and now you're in a pipe. This pipe is going to break up into a number of branches which can be controlled by gates. Your particular gate is open, 
And so now you're going to turbine number three or whatever. The whole system is designed to work as a unit. And then you are flushed down to the lower part of the river as just another one of many drops of water that went through the dam. Everything about Hoover Dam is big. Those penstock pipes that would actually transport the water were so large, there was not a railroad or a truck in the nation that could haul them out to Black Canyon. They had to be fabricated at the site, a job so big that a separate company, Babcock and Wilcox, was contracted to get it done. The largest of the penstock pipes, 30 feet in diameter, had to be built from three segments of flat steel, each one rolled to comprise a third of the 30-foot circle. Then these pipe sections, each weighing 170 tons, had to be taken out to the dam on a special trailer that could support them, hoisted by the cableways, then wrestled into the tunnels. There, they had to be grafted together to form a watertight conduit from the intake towers to the generators. The two outside diversion tunnels were to be reused as the dam's spillways. These giant channels, deep as a 10-story building, would protect the dam in case of flooding. At full capacity, each spillway on either side of the river could handle the entire flow of Niagara Falls. Without them, floodwaters would stream over the dam itself and eat away its foundation. You don't want that raw water going wild. So the spillways on both sides of the dams, and, and this is true of any dam, the spillway is always designed so that you dissipate energy as the water flows over the dam, so you don't have too much energy scouring down below the dam and removing your rock, which then would eat underneath the dam. Because even though that you think of it as solid rock, for the water, it's just another material to cut down through. Freedom for the Colorado River ended on February 1st, 1935, when workers lowered a steel gate to plug up the last diversion tunnel. For two years, the river had been diverted through the Black Canyon walls. Now it was imprisoned entirely. And as its water began backing up behind the biggest hunk of concrete in the world, Lake Mead was born. After the break, May 1935, the magnificent site of the completed Hoover Dam, when Discovery Sunday returns. Discover timeless styling that goes beyond fashion. Discover superior quality and attention to detail that's backed by more than mere words. Discover the finest cruiser that delivers an extraordinary experience unmatched by any other. Discover yourself on a Royal Star by Yamaha. I talk to my mom every Sunday. That's why I signed up for MCI Five Cent Sundays. At five cents a minute, a half an hour is just $1.50. And that same call was three times as much with AT&T's One Ring. Call 1-800-SUNDAYS. You save more with MCI. At Cigna, we care about people who have babies. We care about companies that make steel and about companies that make bread. We care about life and about all that makes life great or possible or just better. At Cigna, we care because it is our business to care. But we also care because, well, we have babies too. Cigna, a business of caring. In the soul of every Bridgestone Potenza lie the twists and turns of the legendary Formula One Grand Prix courses of the world. Using a tapered tread element derived from the Potenza F1 racing rain tire, the Potenza RE 910 street tire handles the road wet or dry. Bridgestone Potenza with Unity. Technology-driven performance with the soul of Formula One. Get a limited edition Formula One watch free with the purchase of four selected Bridgestone tires. On TLC, at 120 degrees, your brain starts to sizzle. Minutes in freezing water, and you're a goner. 
And in the jungle, there are a hundred ways to die if you don't know what to do. Now, experience the true stories of ordinary people who fought to survive nature's punishing extremes. Survivor Science, premiering tonight, 9 to 11, Eastern and Pacific on TLC. Extreme adventures for your mind. At the gateway to the East, it is the keeper of knowledge and secrets. It has mystified us for centuries, but how was it built? What does it mean? The mystery of the Sphinx is next as Discovery Sunday continues. Tomorrow on Wild Discovery, would you do this? How about this? Steve Irwin goes in search of the 10 deadliest snakes in the world on Wild Discovery. Tomorrow at 9 Mountain 8 Pacific on the Discovery Channel. Now back to building of Hoover Dam. In May of 1935, they poured the last bucket of concrete and topped off Hoover Dam, two years ahead of schedule. That September, President Franklin D. Roosevelt officially dedicated it, calling it, of course, Boulder Dam. The following year, the first generator was installed and Hoover Dam was in business. Today, the 17 generators there kick out more than 2 million kilowatts of electricity, enough to serve more than 18 million people a day, lighting up towns as far away as San Diego, California. But that was not the reason it was built. The primary purpose of the dam was built to stop the great floods on the Colorado River, because shortly after the turn of the century, they started irrigating along the lower Colorado River and the Imperial Valley and the Coachella Valleys, where today over half of the fresh fruits and vegetables in this country are grown. Hoover Dam was the first structure built to manage the lower Colorado River, a system that now irrigates more than one million acres in the United States and half a million in Mexico. The whole project, which includes the dam and all its irrigation channels, cost $165 million, and it has all been repaid through the sale of electrical power. Talk about a bargain. If any country ever got a bargain, it's Boulder Hoover, Hoover Dam. But the true cost of Hoover Dam was paid not in money, but in human life. Officially, 96 men were killed while building Hoover Dam. But it is accepted by experts today that six companies and the government covered up many other deaths. I'm not sure what the numbers were. I had heard that the total numbers directly related to the dam were over 100. <clears throat> but this, and this is a crappy safety record from the point of view, I mean, anybody's point of view. No one ever knows for sure because people died of carbon monoxide poisoning and, and, and for lingering disease that came from those kind of things and the heat and so on. That no one will really ever, ever know the total, you know, some have said as high as 200, but uh, I, who knows? The greatest side effect of Hoover Dam is the recreational use of the reservoir impounded behind it, Lake Mead. It backs up for almost 120 miles, all the way back to the Grand Canyon. With 550 miles of shoreline, it is the nation's largest man-made lake, providing year-round aquatic sports for more than 9 million visitors annually. The sands of the ancient desert now lie more than 500 feet below the surface of Lake Mead, along with Ragtown, the old gravel pit, the roads, the rail lines, the workplace of more than 5,000 men for five years. I thought that we, we're here, we're doing something that's gonna last forever. And the concrete, all five and a half million tons Clifford Jones helped pour inside Hoover Dam is slowly curing, becoming stronger every day. Next week, the circus comes right into your living room. Get first-hand views as tiny cameras will put you right in the middle of the crazy mayhem and marvelous wonders of the circus. High Wire on Sidetrack, tomorrow on the Discovery Channel. Colorado. 
trucks, man, noise, thunder, dust. Everything is just harsh, harsh, harsh. It would forever change the West. Hoover Dam. Tonight on The American Experience. Major funding for The American Experience is provided by the annual financial support of PBS viewers like you and by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to enhance public understanding of the role of technology. The foundation also supports the Sloan Technology Series, a collection of books chronicling the major technologies of the 20th century. And by miracle Grow Plant Foods. For flowers, for vegetables, for a beautiful show, for lawns and for shrubs. Whatever you grow, a gardener's true friend is miracle Grow. Each American experience is made possible by Liberty. Liberty Mutual Insurance.